Yeah, well, as Amstabad said, I've been doing photography for about 15 years. I started in 2004 or five. that's when I started traveling. And yeah, I was very inspired by other people's travel photography. Um, after those trips, I was exposed to the concept of travel photography after I did my first trips. And I was very drawn to people from different ethnicities, different cultures. Um, and I wanted to capture these portraits of people like I'd seen other people do. And I never studied photography, but I was just really inspired and I had an emotional connection to um, travel photography and people photography especially. But I also love landscape photography and wildlife. Um, I'm really interested in emotion and artistic expression. I'm doing photography for art. Um, as you know, I'm also a pianist and a musician. That's my training. I studied writing music for film and performing piano. And I always loved um, performing like, you know, really impressive, fast and emotional or famous songs. I don't know, I've always wanted to impress people with my um, piano playing. And I kind of liken that to the photography where I'm trying to impress the audience with my work. Like I'm doing it for myself, but I also really love the idea of pleasing other people through the art, which is just like playing piano. I mean, it's one thing to play for yourself, that's fine. But when you can play and you can have other people impressed and, and enjoy that and give you feedback and you get the lovely feedback, it feels really good. So I think there's a similarity with my photography that every photo I show is all about having high impact and impressing the viewer and hopefully giving them an emotional reaction. Um, yeah, so I started, as I said, 2004, 2005. I kept traveling every year after that first trip and practicing and meeting people and just practicing Photoshop every year, learning a few more techniques, just starting simple, learning how to rotate and do simple contrast. Um, and then I eventually started to get asked to do some work in Australia, like some weddings and some headshot photography for actors. So I invested in some studio lights and I'll show you some now of my work that no one ever sees because it's not travel, but it's um, some of my headshot photos I did with um, softbox and lights. And so while I don't travel with lights, it's a very similar concept, the way to the concept of just um, being able to imagine strong light on a subject and what strong light should look like. Um, and yeah, and, and you can see these have got, yeah, a softbox and reflectors and all sorts of things. I also was asked to do some weddings. I've done five weddings, but I never advertised in Australia to, to do commercial photography or weddings or anything. It's just people asking me to do the jobs. But I decided I really just like travel. This is a family portrait I did in Australia. So I was doing some family shots, some model shots, some bands, some musicians. These are some musicians. And so, I, you know, this was all really good practice for me, working with studio lights and just working with lots of people in Australia to doing, doing, their, doing their shoots for them. Um, but it was the travel photography that I really loved the most. So I never pushed myself to work as a photographer in Australia because I was also the mus a musician, as you know, I'm, and I still am teaching piano. Um, and I decided I'll just focus all my attention on photography and sort of market myself as just a travel photographer. Maybe it's better to have a niche or something special about you that you're not, not so general, but you specializing in one thing. And for me, that's travel photography. Um, I entered a lot of competitions and around 2007, eight, nine, 10, 11. And I found entering competitions was a great platform for me to get my work seen by more people because even if I to win and often of course I did not win but you might get an honorable mention or a second place and then articles may be put out about the the, the runner-ups or websites might have the photographers who came second third fourth or something like that and so for me I found entering lots of competitions was the way I started to get my name out there a bit and then as a result of that I've I was contacted by various people to have my photos used in their magazines which is always an honor. Uh, so I've been in many um, travel magazines, um, airplane, this is like in-flight magazine for Singapore Airlines. 
that you're seeing now with the um, Myanmar fisherman. This photo was from 2011. And this one from Brazil. And this is, so a lot of travel magazines seem to like my photos and wanted to use them inside the magazine and on the cover as well. And I never really pushed myself by sending companies my work. They just found it on the internet and then sent me an email. So I guess I could say that by having a website, it's a great way to get potential customers buying your photos. I don't think Facebook is enough. Um, I don't think many professional companies will contact someone on Facebook to buy a photo. So yeah, having a website was essential. And I, ha I had a simple one on pbase.com, a free one. But um, a friend of mine who was doing web design said, you need a better website. So he designed a new one for me for a decent price. And we've made some changes to it since. But um, yeah, having that website's been great because I get people sending me emails through the website, you know, here and there. <laughs> And uh, yeah, let's keep going. Got all these magazines and um, various calendars and writing. I've been, I mean, I get asked by photography magazines also to ask to write an article about something. Travel photography, obviously, and portraits, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then in 2014, I was contacted by a company called Luminous Journeys, and they wanted me to work with a Myanmar photographer. Um, as the Westerner photographer who spoke English to co-lead the tours um, to help explain things clearly in English. <laughs> Led me to Myanmar Plus on the internet and he just contacted me out of the blue and we did a Skype session and yeah, things worked out well and now I've been leading photography tours around Asia. We started just in Myanmar, but now we go to India and Vietnam, Bali, Bhutan, Japan, Southeast Asia. So it's very fortuitous and very good luck, I think, for me to have that. But I think, yeah, if we're talking about marketing, I think coming, creating the good work, creating the great product, maybe the most important thing, at least for me, having a good product, and then that's how I've gotten this work, rather than me self-promoting and pushing myself you know i've been pushing my work by putting it online a lot and i try to get it out there on the internet um and i've also so i've done 20 to 22 photo tours now for luminous journeys and i made a book about my myanmar trips hardcover coffee table book and that's currently selling in the yangon international airport and um got another book there who will i become Okay, let's talk about photography now. And I already mentioned my favorite three types of photography, landscape, wildlife, and people. So let's talk about those three things. So we'll start first with landscape. This is one of my first landscapes that got good attention and you know, got some, won some photography competitions in 2007 from India. It's a Trichy, Trichy Temple. And yeah, so this photo I entered into a lot of competitions and it won a few and yeah, that was a good platform for me then to keep entering more. I guess the most important thing for landscapes is being there at sunrise or sunset. So the time of day really limits you maybe and when you can shoot landscape. Often, if you, unless you have filters, which I don't carry filters. So landscape's not my primary thing. So I, I'm pretty simple with my setup. I just have a Nikon 24 to 70 and lens as well 28 to 300 um so this is all this is handheld <laughs> and yeah i guess with landscapes it's very hard i think to find a scene that's really interesting and you have to have that one focal point in the shot often it's not enough just to shoot a nice beach or a rainforest like it's beautiful in real life but i found Beautiful places, still hard to shoot landscapes, but you have to find that one thing to have as a focal point or a subject in the landscape. So this is Myanmar, and that temple, I think, is an example here of the focal point. And in Bali, I, again, these are all sunrises. So yeah, landscapes are hard because you've got to find these beautiful places in the world, which is hard to do, and be there at that right time of day. 
So I have a much, I have fewer landscapes in my folio. Certainly a lot more people because people are everywhere. There's so many people, not so many beautiful scenes to find. And you have to look for them and work for them and hike there and be there at the early morning hours. But I do love landscapes. I think there's a nice emotional connection to a beautiful scene like this. This is Mount Bromo from Indonesia. Um, I guess you can also play with colours quite a lot with landscapes. You can push colours to be a little bit surreal um, in a way you can't do that with people so much. And yeah, landscapes, are, I find the best landscape photographers are often really, um, you know, pushing the colours and the light and all sorts of effects. So yeah, landscapes photography is not necessarily a reflection of reality. <laughs> so I find, yeah. This one is um, in Japan, of course. It's also sunrise a little bit after, but it's a very early morning shot of Mount Fuji there. The iconic Fuji. And I have a photo here from India, which is of course in Jodhpur, of the um, Maharanga Fort. Again, it's a sunrise shoot, being there in the dark and waiting for the sunrise to come up and and then adding a bit of extra color in Photoshop. So there's a bit of a pink, extra pink and purple grad, graduated filter in the sky here. I think and you again, need to yeah. hike to this point. Sorry? You had to hike to this point or? Yeah, you hike up some rocks. You need a nature guide to come to, come to this place. Right. Have you been? Yeah. Uh, I tried going there. They, they said the same thing. Uh, you need a guide and this and that. So I just yeah. decided not to go. <laughs> you have to be organized in advance. It's called Beat the Heat. Um, and you have to organize to have the guide there and there's security. So you have to go through a gate to get, and then the guide will take you up here. And he's a naturalist and he can, ex naturalist, sorry, and he can explain about the rocks and the landscape yes, and the yes. birds. It's a nature walk, more or less, yeah. It's a nature walk, yeah, called Beat the Heat. Um, and one from Egypt. Uh, lucky with the nice sky there. Oh yeah, I guess landscapes rely on the sky so much, don't they? You have to have amazing clouds for the landscape photo to be successful often. Um, but not necessarily, but yeah, great clouds help, don't they? This is a late afternoon shot. So again, early morning or late afternoon. And again, hard work to go to a place that's really beautiful, like this, you know, going in a Jeep and driving out of the, with the guide and camping overnight in the desert to get these landscape shots. So yeah, I'm a big fan of landscapes, but um, yeah, I don't have quite as many. I also love wildlife photography. I've always loved animals, um, but it, once again, hard to do because you've got to go to these locations that have the animals. So yeah, people photography is looking really easy now because there's always people everywhere. This is in Kenya. And I've done a number of safaris in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, South Africa. I find with animal photography that often it's most successful if the animal can be portraying a human emotion. Um, where you can see an expression or something human-like about the animal. So in this case, it's like he's really aggressively getting excited about his grass or his leaf there. Or in this case, one of my most successful shots that I've taken is this tiny lion cub and lionesses walking down a road in Kenya. A very, very popular picture, right? Yeah, very popular. It went very viral on lots of cute animal websites and Instagram pages. It became um, a popular meme. It became a meme material. Oh yeah, and lots of people captioning it, talking about like as if it's two female mothers and like a gay pride parade and all sorts of different things. Actually, they're sisters because lions, you know, the, the, fam the sisters all stay together and look after the, each other. And yeah, it's a little runt, like a little, very small cub. And the siblings were much, much more healthy and bigger looking and they were running ahead. Anyway, that was a, a very special moment to shoot. I remember feeling very emotional to shoot this, like so lucky to see a lion cub and I've never seen one. And suddenly it's walking right up to the Jeep. And I just had my, I think it's like an 18 to 200 millimeter lens at this point. I never invested in very big zoom lenses. And again, there's that element of um, personification where it looks like the animals are doing something human. 
which I think is what makes good animal photos. But you've got to be so patient to get these opportunities. So not everyone can be a good wildlife photographer because you have to be able to spend a long time in one place with animals just waiting for something interesting to happen. Whereas m most visitors come and see the animal, then they go on to the next one. A good wildlife photographer would stay for hours just waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen that will make the photo special. Again, this one in Japan, they are doing something human-like, you know, very caring and grooming each other. And you can read into emotions on their faces, or on one, the one face. It's like a human emotion. Our cousins, after all. Sorry? Our near cousins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so far from us. <laughs> yeah, monkeys are cool. Okay, especially the ones in Japan, snow monkeys. They're actually macaques. Uh, yeah, macaques. And from Brazil, I've just got a couple more animal shots. Yeah, waiting and waiting. And finally, the birds do something interesting, which looks like they're grooming, well, they are grooming. And one's getting a lot of pleasure from it. And that makes the photo more successful than just the shot of representing what the bird looks like. So yeah, that requires a lot of time and patience. And going to locations in the world that have these amazing animals, which again, takes a lot of work to do to go to these places. Another idea, of course, is the patterns of animals. Instead of personifying them, having nice patterns of animals I've found is a good way to shoot wildlife as well. We're talking about trying to make it the photo more, artist, more artistic and emotional than just a representation of the animal, which is what I like to do. And of course, my people photography. Um, yeah, I can get, you can really express, ex express emotion with people photography, can't you? I mean, people are all about emotion. So if I'm interested in emotional art, then that's why I'm shooting people so much. And I love to try to capture lots of different emotions. Um, three different ways to shoot people I've found. One is where you can just interact with them and ask to take a photo. Another is to pay them some money for their time and permission to shoot them. And another way is, of course, doing like a documentary style where you're just um, a journalist, as it were. So this photo I'm showing you now of a monk at the Golden Rock is an example of not interacting and just waiting and being a photojournalist in one respect. But it's not the majority of my photos. I mean, yeah, it's hard. To, it takes so much time and patience and staying in one location for a long time. Maybe we don't have that time to spend in one location. So sometimes you have to make things happen by setting it up. And you can see with my photos, there's always this interaction. I'm always asking to take their photo and they always know I'm taking their photo. And it's very intimate and I've given them direction. I always tell them where to stand and what to do maybe, what to do with their hands, whether to smile or not. Um, the background, let's talk about the background because it's so important for people photography, especially portraits and animal, animals and maybe every subject, maybe many subjects, the background is so important. But especially for people, the background's got to be not too distracting. It should be fairly plain and simple or repetitive. And the colours and the texture should match the subject. Um, so this girl from Brazil in the tri in a tribe with the tribal paint, the background helps tell the story of where she's from and who she is. So it's it's relevant, but it's not distracting because there's no big bright blown out bits. It's all quite smooth and flat and evenly cream. A little bit of brown, I guess that yeah from the trees. It matches her skin color a little bit. This is a classic example of a. A <laughs> background that is so simple, it's just a red robe and I've asked someone to hold that behind him. It's one of the monks robes they have hanging in Myanmar at the monasteries. It's easy to get your hands on and I've asked someone to hold it behind him. And so it makes it so much, so much attention goes onto the eyes and the face. It puts all the viewers' attentions on the, on the face. If there was blown out bits of sun and black lines and things in the background, it would not have such a powerful pull and connection to the face. And also the color being red is completely relevant and it's appropriate because he's wearing red. So it makes it focused shot, very focused. 
I don't think a painter would do something similar. If a painter was painting a face like this, they would keep the background really simple and probably the same sort of color scheme as the person. So yeah, I find painting and photography is actually a lot of similarities. So this is a lady. David, I have a question. Uh, so do you, do you use the external lighting or is it all natural light? It's all natural light, yeah. And this, my God, that's, that's brilliant. Beautiful pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a mixture of natural light and then enhancing the natural light later in Photoshop or Lightroom to make it shine and be very bright. Not yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. My God. It's Thank you. Yeah, it's important to note that all my photos have worked on them carefully in Photoshop to make the highlights as bright as I can get them without it being blown out, but also having it having the shadows and black shadows. Okay. So the key is really bright brights, like almost pure white in some parts, and then really black parts. I make, make sure that some shadows are very black. That's how you get a very powerful, I think, photo. I think most people don't push the brights far enough. Maybe it was all to taste. There's no one way to do this. There's no correct way to edit and to present your photos. But yeah, I think maybe the risk a lot of people Maybe they're editing on bright MacBooks or something and they think it already is bright enough, but then when I see it, it looks a bit dull. Maybe, maybe you can push it further. Maybe push it as far as you can and then back it off. That's what I do. I, I really push it super far and then I pull it back a little bit with the way I edit. Okay, then. brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can continue. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, so in this photo, just yeah, there's so many photos, I can't explain the story behind them all, but this one, it's in a safari lodge in Kenya, and the Maasai has come, I organized for the Maasai to come to this lodge to take some portraits, and yeah. David, very can I ask a question on this picture, please? When you're taking sure. portraits head on, you're, often the photographer tends to show up in the eyes. Do you take <laughs> some care to avoid that, or you just let it roll? Oh, I think it's a good thing actually, because it creates shapes and patterns in the eyeballs. Yeah. And it's I also feel uh, it's good to have yourself in the picture. <laughs> you have to zoom in very far to really see yourself. So it's never a problem that it's distracting in my opinion. Um, yeah, I think catch lights that have lots of shapes and patterns in them are very effective. So if you use a flash, you only get one circle of light in the eye, like one round light. And that's not as engaging, I think, as like sparkling eyes, which is when it's the real world mixed with shadows of things that are in the way. So yeah, the, the, the body of somebody is creating more mixture of black and white dots in the eyes. Uh, oh, David? Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, but you really always have to zoom in pretty far to see the person and it's so it never is distracting. And yeah, most of my photos I'm shooting straight on. This is one example of shooting a little bit higher angle to make the eyes look a bit bigger. And when they look up, often they get brighter eyes because the light source is the sky above. But if we just go back, yeah, all of these other ones, I'm very front on all the time. I never shoot looking up at the person. I don't think that's quite as effective. Like uh, David, yeah. David, in the previous picture of that uh, the tribal man, uh, the highlights on the forehead and the nose coming down—is it due to the was it due to the flash? This photo? Yeah, exactly. This one. You can see the forehead highlights and the highlights coming right on the middle of the nose and a little bit down. Is it the effect of the flash? It's not a flash. No, it's natural light. Um, <laughs> this is a rare example where, okay, so he's, he's in like a dark, so it's like the room, the, the, the lodge, the room in that spot between the open doors and it's bright outside and he's in like the darker, in the darker room, but, and then I've actually put this background in, <laughs> this is a rare photo where I've, um, cut him out and then put him against a different background. So maybe that's why it looks more like a flash because 
if it was against the trees. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that might be giving an illusion of a flash, but yeah, he's in a doorway, really. And yeah, when you're in that dark space, but you're in a sweet spot where it's very bright in front of you, that's when you can get this very strong light that looks like a looks like a softbox and that's a good thing i think because you want it to look super bright in some parts and a lot of subod's work is like that where i think he puts people in a dark area but there's a very bright window or bright doorway or something to the strong light outside um yeah and that's when the editing may be a little bit easier because it already looks good <laughs> so you can almost replicate a flash set up with natural light if it's the right conditions, which is to say being in a dark space, but there's a, there's a hole or a window, or like one small window of light with bright sunlight coming through, or, you know, the bright sky and ground reflecting and shining in, yeah. The greatest flash in the world is sun and the sky. So you just need to use it. But not the direct sun, yeah. <laughs> It can be, yeah. So all of my portraits are not direct sun. So this one, he is in front of a tree, like it's a tree trunk. So this is an outdoor one, like in on location. So the previous one was at the lodge, like so he's in the, halfway in the room and like he's in the doorway to the room and the outside. This one is in the tree, but I guess it's similar because it's a undercover tree, like there's it's in a dark sort of space because the tree is cover. But then there's a window of bright light from the sky created by the covered trees if you know what i mean and that's how you can emulate the flash look it doesn't have to be in a dark room it can be outside but it has to be a dark it's funny it's like yeah it's a sweet spot it's just you have to look for this kind of light i guess but yeah i'm always lo looking up at the sky and looking for a bright where the bright bit of sky is and make sure the face is angled towards the bright brightness um, yeah, so yeah, he's in like an undercover tree, but it just happens that it's a bright, bright window to the sky with the sky in front of him. And same with this girl from Bangladesh. So it's on the stairs to her home, and it's like a roof to like an awning, but it's outdoors, but it's an awning roof. But then there's like a gap in the roof where it's a very strong sunlight or a strong bright light. So it creates that dark shadow smoothly coming up to brightness. And you can't get that if you just shoot anywhere. So you have to find these nice, this is, these are the right places to shoot to get that effect. David, do you retest the skins as well? Do I do like, what, do sorry? Do you soften the skin? No, well, I remove like, um, sometimes I get rid of some shadows. So, so I soften shadows, but not, the skin, I didn't do any blurring of the skin, but okay. I know they look very smooth, Like I, I meant I like uh, frequency separation or something like that, like uh, photo, like in this particular photo of this Bangladeshi girl, uh, and also the other one from like the Gisha girl from uh, a few photos back, they both looked like uh, the face was really smooth and the eyes were really crisp. So that's why I, I was just asking. Mm, I think it, the key there is having them in the strong light. Yeah, if you shoot someone and the light's not strong already, then you get a lot of shadows and on the face that maybe makes it not look so clean and clear. Um, and sometimes I'm removing some shadows that are captured a little bit by taking a sample of good skin and with a brush, like you know, taking an eyedropper and painting over the shadow just with a brush, soft brush, and then take the opacity down so that it balances or it doesn't look too um, plastic or something like that. So but I don't remember for this photo how much of that I did, but I do get rid of shadows that I consider to be ugly on the skin. Um, it's not, yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, it's not changing her skin as much as just getting the light perfect. So yeah, getting the, the bright light and no ugly shadows is a big key. Yeah. So yeah, it looks like a softbox in her eyes because it is just like a narrow bit of gap in the roofs to the outside bright world. Otherwise she's very undercover. 
she can't she, she can't be too far back in the undercover because then she'd be too dark. So she's got to be close enough to that area of bright light. So I hope that makes sense because I know it's hard to say. Yeah, well, how do you find good light? What's good light? That's my interpretation of good light is something. Yeah, being in a bit of a darker space, but close to the very bright light just outside. And again, always looking at the sky and looking around to find where the brightest bit of light is coming from and make sure the person is angled towards that. Sometimes I just ask them to look at it because it's better that they're looking away from the camera, like in profile, but they bright eyes and bright face rather than looking at the camera in the dark shadows. Yeah. Um, Hello, David. Hey. Uh, a big okay. fan of your portraits, like so good. Uh, so, so I just want to know, like, uh, like if you have the time after this session and all, like maybe like uh, you could show us uh, some of the some of the techniques like you use for post processing your images, or maybe like give some tips regarding the post processing of these portraits that you do, like, like if you could, that'd I be think, wonderful. I think for that we'll have to get him again and do a post processing session. <laughs> perfect, yeah, perfectly, 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 absolutely. It will be an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sniper Monk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm using a laptop now. I don't use this laptop. It's just for travel and this. On my computer, I've got Photoshop, of course, and I use the big screen. And I don't edit on a laptop. I just edit on my computer at home on a big screen. Something that's important is the screen's not too bright. I've turned the brightness down of the screen. I think if you have a very bright screen, then you think it's bright enough already. But then when you print the photo, you'll think it's too dark or you look at it on someone else's device and it won't look bright enough. So yeah, that's my advice. If you can, not to edit on a bright laptop. And if you do, turn the brightness down a bit. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you for this one. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, a posing idea I have is to have people leaning on something so and, and touching things. So when you're shooting people, yeah, good to have them leaning on something like this. And I give these directions to people to get the shots that I have in my mind. So I have, oh, sorry. Oh, hello, we're going everywhere. Um, I have a lot of posing ideas in my mind. It's not that, I mean, it's quite simple really, but yeah, I don't think it's hard to remember something near the face leaning on something, interacting with something. This time we have a fan near the face. So if you're doing the shoot with this Vietnamese girl, again, she's in the good light. So that was important. I've got the background nice where she's behind, she's in front of some plants with some purple flowers in a garden. It's like the gardens at a temple. So before I shoot someone, I'm always looking around, looking, looking to find a good background. It's, I don't just shoot someone where they are generally because it's probably not a nice background behind them. It's probably too bright and full of clutter or distraction or something not relevant to the person or the scene. Here, it's nice to have the natural flowers and also the colors match my fan. So that's a nice bonus. So we have a purple theme. Yeah, and again, she's got that smooth, bright skin, doesn't she? I think it's because she's angled directly towards the bright light and she's sort of under a bit of a tree in a bush sort of thing crouching in a bush somewhere in a hello like david a, great shadows hello hi my name is neelima you have some awesome photos and i've it's a pleasure to have you online here so we could some people like us could learn <laughs> um you. i wanted to ask you the portraits you take do you still do you use the same 24 70 or do you have a prime lens for the for the portraits no, they're all 24 to 70. All right, all right. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Please continue. No problem. Sure. I've, I've never used a prime lens. I'm so minimal and with my equipment and I'm so, I don't, I don't do photography for the equipment. Like I don't care that much about it, to be honest. So I'm just so simple. I just have this 24 to 70 lens and then a zoom lens for those times when you need to zoom in far. I think that's important. So I just carry those two lenses all the time. Um, of course, there's benefits with the prime lens, but I think more important than that is who you're photographing, so the faces that you're finding, and what the background is and what the light is. Yeah, making sure they're in good light and making sure that, you know, like the pose and the scene is a good scene more than the gear. But yeah, 
I'm sure. I think, yeah, one, okay, one issue I would have with a prime lens with travel is that you're totally restricted to that. And you, often you never know what, where you're going to shoot when you travel. So I know I am going to meet this girl to take some photos of her, but I don't know where the right background and light will be. It might be inside a little temple and very close. So an 85 millimeter or something fixed or 100, who knows, would be too, too much of a zoom. So yeah, I love the idea of having the flexibility to zoom in and out with a 24 to 70. Mm. But there's no one way to do photography. So certainly, yeah, it works well to have the prime if you, if you like. But I just like being minimal as well, not too, too many things. I always like to look like I'm not even a photographer <laughs> so that when I meet people, it looks like, it seems like, you know, we're just having a nice interaction, then I might ask to take a photo and bring out the camera. But actually a lot of these photos, like this one is on my photo tour, where it's already organized that I'll be shooting some models. Same with this one, this on a photo tour in Myanmar, where we go to visit these ladies who have tattooed faces. And of course we give them some money so that we can, which is what they expect, because that's the kind of their business now and they sell these fabrics. Yeah, so I can give her direction. It's not, it's not so hard if, to give people direction in that case when they're being paid a little bit and they're happy to have their photo taken because they make some money from it and they want that. It's, they need the business, some people. Um, so yeah, again, looking around, it's a really bright outdoor village, no good background, but I found these textiles and I made her stand in front of the textiles and then frame the face with the textiles and put her hands up there. All the same concepts again, having something around the face I just find to be very powerful in portrait photography. And so again, with this girl from Brazil, she has a puppy, she holds it up here, and then I have to give her more instruction to put it right up to her face and demonstrate like this, like this, but like this. And I smile and I make it fun so, so that it's, she's happy to do that. And yeah, that's my technique. This is, and this is an example of not paying someone, but just, I was invited to this village to spend some time there. And yeah, I could interact with people and meet them. But the Maasai series is an example of paying uh, to take their photo, as you can expect with tribes like this. I'm sure you guys have done similar things on various photo tours around India where you have to, where it's harder to meet the tribes and they would expect you to. Yeah, pay and it, them makes, a bit. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, it's very highly debated on why someone should pay someone to get shot. But uh, at the end, we pay models. When you want to shoot a model in the studio, we pay them. So similarly, we can pay them too because it's their source of income. Yeah. For some people, that's their source of income and they're expecting it. And they want to, want to do that. And other people you just meet in the street and it's just a nice interaction and then there's no need to pay them any money because you both kind of had fun meeting each other and spending a bit of time together and hopefully you make, can make it fun. You show them the photo on the back and they like it. Yeah, so it all depends who you're shooting, I suppose. This lady from Bangladesh, certainly no need to pay anything because I'm just exploring in the village and meeting people and they're showing me around, introducing me to people and they're all happy if I take their photo. So yeah, and again, she's in like an outdoor covered area, but there's a bright light outside and she's just in that sweet spot between, yeah, where the shady undercover part ends and then this bright light out there, but not in the direct bright light hand to the face. This time, instead of hand to the face, it's uh, leave, leaves to the face. Another idea of have, to have, yeah, looking around what you can use in the scene to put near the face and it brings attention to the eyes when something's touching the face. So fabrics, the dog, <laughs> toys, leaves, hands. Fabrics is a good one though, as often there's materials around in that look cool. The fan for the Vietnamese lady. Um, jewelry, someone but holding jewelry. Uh, or hang one thing to note uh, for everyone is whatever that David is using is the complimentary stuff. You know, like uh, leaves in this case is part of the jungle. The fan or what you call that uh, Vietnam picture. I mean, it's part of their culture. The monkey was part of their uh, culture. So, I mean, oh, yeah. at the end, it should be something that adds on. 
Yeah, that's true. It all, everything in the photo is relevant. There's a general concept thinking. Yeah, nothing in the photo shouldn't be there that has nothing to do with the scene you're trying to portray. Another way of shooting I love is conceptualizing a scene. Um, so sort of recreating real life that happens, but it, you weren't there to capture it. It's very hard to get this scene to happen. If you're just walking through their instrument making workshop. They make musical instruments in Bali here because the light's so perfect, you wouldn't get that where they normally are working. And the background's so non-distracting and works for this scene. So yeah, I love this about photography because it's so creative. Like it really exercises your creative brain to, to put a scene together. It's hard, it's not easy at all. Like it's difficult because there's so many elements to make work and making people look natural in the thing they're doing requires a lot of direction and fixing or like, and it's like little by little, the final shot, the first shot was never this. There was lots of changes and saying that doesn't look right. What if he puts his hand here, put your hand here, look here and tried all these different variations until it's working. So yeah, this is something I love to do. And I think most people don't, many people don't do this. I don't know. But yeah, for me, I just love imagine it's create it's like imagining it in your mind and then putting it together. In this example, I actually did location scout, like look around the place before I had the Maasai tribe to shoot. And then I went back and wrote down ideas and even maybe tried to draw like storyboards. So yeah, it's like <laughs> it's really creative. You're just creating the shot yourself from nothing, imagining it, putting it together. And this is those notes from that safari place in Kenya. After looking around the locations, I was writing down the location ideas and shot ideas. So one of those you can't really see, but would probably say that the kids are helping each other to climb up the rock, pulling each other up one by one. So it's literally yeah, like, uh, it's like being a director of a movie. Yeah, it feels like that, directing a movie <laughs> sometimes very much in this one. This is from that book I showed at the beginning, the cover, Who Will I Become? So I was asked by this lady who runs um, Growing Growing Leaders organization to, to take photos for a book that she was creating about who, like what kids love to do can be the job that they would do for the rest of their life. So for example, if you love making jewelry, you could be a jewelry maker, or if you love sport, you can play sport. If you love cooking as a kid, then you can be a chef. So we did a whole series of shots about around those concepts where we came up with concepts like making jewelry from things down on the beach and putting them together. So yeah, it's so much fun to, to do this. It's really hard, I think, to make it work, but it's satisfying when it works. You just have to see it in your mind, I guess, and imagine what looks real. How do people really do the action you want them to do? Not only that, is of course, it's getting the right background and the right light always. In this tribe in Brazil, I remember walking through this space to get to their village like another 10 minutes away, but I noted this is a really nice scene, like that tree root that they're sitting on and the moss on the tree and the background was quite even, like good, good greenery in the background and the light was good here as well, like there was nice light coming in. It's not, it's not direct sunlight, but um, natural light from a bright bit of the sky just there. So yeah, I brought them back to this point to do this shot. So yeah, the background almost comes first in many cases, I could say. Looking for the background even before you've got the person. And do you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so when you're doing your travel photography, Look around for backgrounds and imagine the shot even before you've got a person to shoot and what imagine what are they going to be doing in the shot and this is and you start to do the same things again or you like i've done so many shots where people are helping each other to get ready or you know do their get their dress right or adjusting their clothes or helping each other do their hair and stuff like that like it's just the concept i, I have in my mind but it looks a bit different every time because everyone's different and the scene is different but yeah, it's but as, my... uh, as uh, David rightly said, it's one of the hardest things to do, uh, setting up. 
because uh, mm. you know there's a common uh, debate again on stew mercury staging his pictures and always mm. tell them whoever complains on that i tell them try to stage a picture and you will know what it takes so it's very yeah. very hard you need to know your composition in and out to really uh, get a well uh, staged shot yeah yeah most of steve mccurry's photos uh, set up like this concept of directing people where to stand where to be what to do the action he does it very very well and they always look very natural so i really admire him about that i have a question david mm-hmm. Hi there, uh, in order to identify right background what would be the do's and don'ts what are the key ingredients um nothing that distracts like something that stands out like a black pole or black line or bright bright sunlight may be a key ingredient that the background is flat and neutral and not just not, not, nothing that stands out so yeah lots of green in this case and no big bright because dappled light looks pretty ugly you know like really bright sunlight hitting something in my opinion um yeah so very even and flat and consistent maybe the keys without a big black pole okay. or yeah or rubbish yeah. or something hi uh david uh hi. do you uh, in this situation uh, what metering technique you use you use the uh, same it is a nature you want to capture all I hope it is not, you know, matrix. It, it should be, since people are there, we will be using more of the spot metering or center with right? Um, I don't remember for this. Um, I think I generally do just use, leave it on the matrix metering mode. But I, but I control the exposure myself in the end by changing the settings or using the exposure compensate, making it darker when needed. Um, I think if you get the light right, like shooting someone in, in a good good space where it's the light's even and it's it's good good quality light, then you can yeah, it doesn't so much matter, especially if you can then override what the camera thinks it should be. So if the camera meters it and thinks it needs to be one thing, it's often wrong anyway. So then you just darken the whole photo by changing something you know change ISO just to, or that. Change. just to add to that uh, as you can see in this scene it's not like a very uh, huge difference in light uh, the foreground light and background light is almost the same so easily uh, the matrix met, uh, metering can uh, manage this kind of a scene so you don't really need a spot or center weight just to add to what david said hmm. isn't the metering just trying the camera is trying to get the right settings for you right yeah the light is uh, light is averaged by the metering setups like matrix uh, averages a lot and spot averages the focal point wherever the focus point is it will only read that light those pixels so it's that way but uh, for, yeah yeah no go ahead no uh, that's what i'm saying when there's a real uneven light if suppose let's say there's a, a strong sun in the background sunlight in the background then yes, maybe your camera can get confused. It can underexpose your subject or it can overexpose mm. your background. But in this kind of a scene, matrix can do the work very, very easily. Uh, mm. Very frankly, 99% of your work can be done by matrix. Again, mm. adding to that, uh, hi, David, Shamim here. Again, adding hi to there. that, yeah, the difference, be- I feel the difference between matrix and the spot metering is hardly one or two stops more. You know, it can still manage with dialing down or dialing up. I, I think that's what I think. Right, uh, not a huge. It's too much about matrix or spot. I think we can still manage with the matrix. Yeah, thank you. Maybe if you have to work really quickly, then it's important that the camera gets it right and it would be then important to be on spot and, or matrix. But if you have time to then just override the camera settings and choose it yourself, you know, then it's not so important, I think. <laughs> Yeah, so sorry, yeah, I, I just generally leave it on, generally I leave it on matrix, especially for the wider scenes, yeah, and the people. Yep. I don't change the mode, the metering, to be honest. But also, you know, use Photoshop to help darken things, so, you know, I've got my Photoshop to also help me out if the exposure's not perfect. Let's talk about composition techniques now. 
And I want to talk about the rule of thirds, first of all, because that has to be mentioned and you all know it. So of course the, the temples in the top third. Most of my photos kind of follow the rule of thirds. Uh, his face is in the top third, upper third, his body's on the far right third. So I spend quite a long time carefully cropping, trying different versions, a bit wider, a bit more close up, and then looking at them back to back and choosing the best one. Their eyes are in the top third. And you start to see a lot of rule of thirds examples. Yeah. The time you can break the rule of thirds, which is about putting something off center, is if it's a symmetrical scene. And in this case, it's symmetrical, and so therefore the subject can be right in the middle. It's Bangladesh. So yeah, I do like symmetry, where it's pretty much the same thing on either side. And remember in those times, the subject can be right in the middle of the photo when it's symmetrical shot. So off center for rule of thirds and symmetry can be in the middle. Sometimes you can fill the frame with a repeating pattern. In this case, the bird feathers. In this case, repeating with lots of faces. So another composition technique to keep in mind, filling the frame with patterns. I'm sure you've all done that. It could be with birds flying or flowers or people in this case, Egypt. Oops. And this is from uh, the Kumbh Mela, of course, in India, only in India, would you see, would you see this <laughs> craziness? Yeah, it's fun filling the frame with all the bodies. Uh, David, this was this year or uh, which Kumbh Mela was this? Last year in Priya Garage. Oh, okay, last year. I mean, sorry, yeah. I meant last year. So you were there. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was there as well. Yeah, yeah, I was there. It's okay. pretty nuts. It's pretty crazy, but it was a really amazing experience. And yeah, amazing. And I'll just talk about a few more composition techniques before we finish up. So this one is in Jodhpur. Also, just this is just on my recent trip. And it's the idea of having lots of space around the subject so that they stand out and nothing in the way. Um, what's it called? Something to ground. Uh, figure, to ground. figure to ground. Yeah, figure to ground. Yeah, really it's just about separation and clean all around the subject. And often, yeah, so these girls are white, so the background is black and they stand out well against the background. And these ladies are black against the very bright sky and water. I make the sky and water brighter in Photoshop so that they really stand out clearly, so that they read clearly. I think it's so important that the viewer can connect and see straight away what the subject is, not have to try to find it. So clar clarity is important. And the figure to ground concept of a dark thing against the bright thing or a bright thing against the dark thing, and especially clear of any distraction all around it, nothing going through the figure is very important. Lots of good space around the subject. Um, quickly, we can talk about lines. And we have here lots of diagonal lines. I do love looking for lines in the scene. Leading lines, diagonal lines, curvy lines. Here are some curvy lines in Vietnam. And then, of course, it's not enough for me just to have the curvy lines, but then I wait around and ask for a farmer to come by and ask her to walk along it just to provide that little bit of interest. But I like that human element, as you know. Similar concept, this is also Vietnam, but finding the scene first, I think, seeing that that would be beautiful, all the curvy lines, and then putting the person in that scene with the repeating lines. I guess it's like a leading line a little bit because it leads you to the people. Uh, David, a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chetan. Uh, when would you like to have human elements in the landscape? Like for this scene, how do you decide? Or what is the That's factor which you think? Yeah. I guess if the scene is not interesting enough, like there's no one clear focal point scene. So if there's a beautiful temple, that's enough, I think, to be a, a good focal point, a good subject. But in a rice terrace, there's not really one focal point often, it's just repeating hills and lines. So in that case, then I think the people are necessary. But yeah, if, 
if there's a if there's a really interesting focal point already, like a volcano or like yeah, I mean, okay. something. Okay. A temple okay, okay. is a good example. Yeah. Okay. Also, I Thanks. think it shows the scale of the picture, right? When you put the human element, we could see the whole scale of the landscape. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. But even a photo like this one, like if the elephants and the people weren't in it, it's just not that interesting. I think it's some brown water and some hills. Like that's not. So yeah, that, it's a beautiful place in real life to be there. But I think I can get a good photo unless there's that a nice boat there or something. There's got to be some focal point, and if there isn't then I guess that's when people are certainly the solution for you there. I really love lines and patterns, repeating patterns to create, you know, repeating subjects to create a line of people, finding patterns in the scene, that's a big thing that I love to do. This is off a bridge in Vietnam. So perfect uh, social distancing here. <laughs> Yes. And, and then they're all covered. They're all covered. I guess it's cold in this place. They've got, they're all covered up. One more thing about the uh, direction. Yeah, if there's someone going in a direction, I like to have lots of space for them to be going into, rather than if he was on the edge of the frame leaving it. I don't think that's as effective in most cases. So if someone's looking in a direction, there's lots of space on that side and they're off on, on the other side. Um, and the only exception I've found that works is if there's a repeating pattern behind them, that then it's okay for them to be off to the side. So for example, a wall or something that's got an interesting repeating pattern, then the person could be off on the far right looking out. But in most cases you don't have that. So if someone's walking or moving or a bike or a car, it's always good to have the space for them to go into. And there's a framing the subject, just another big thing. So it's in my mind, look for frames as I'm walking around. And this is a great example of finding the scene first and then just waiting a while for the monks to come and then they can sit in that chair and I'll frame them with that lovely tree that goes around. So framing, looking for windows, doorways, curtains, that someone can be in the frame. That's usually quite powerful for if you wanted to create artistic portraits. And here's a scene in Bali of kids playing soccer. They've got the spider boat framing them. So he's looking for the frame and trying to find one to make it more interesting. A uh, new photo that I've just been working on from India, of course. And that's kind of framed by the trees. And sometimes changing the perspective. I do like, like to do the bird's eye view thing quite often. I don't have a drone, but I can stand on a bridge or from a balcony and shoot looking down, or even in this case, I'm standing on a chair. And it also gets rid of problematic backgrounds because you can have ground as the background and that's usually quite even and no strong light, no, no bright light or anything, that's a problem. So standing on a bridge. If you're just standing on tiptoes or on your feet, you can still look down if there's someone on the ground, especially if it's a kid, because they're quite small. So I'm just standing, looking down. And once again, giving direction for this kid to run and jump into the fishing nets to make it more interesting. Yeah, again, to what you were saying before, when do you know when to put a person in? I think, yeah, the fishing nets alone isn't enough. Just for me, that isn't clear what they are even maybe, or yeah, but putting somebody in the fishing nets working, or in this case, playing, it makes a huge difference. Silhouettes is always in my mind. I'm always thinking about shooting somebody against the sun because you can create really powerful um, figures and symbolic, symbolic kind of photos. So yeah, always shooting against the sun if it's a big clear spit, clear scene, like a lake or yeah, in this case, a sand dune where you can go a bit lower and look up and there's nothing behind the person to cover up their body. So I've got a few silhouette photos to show you. Sunset, of course. And you get the colors. This is in sunrise, shooting against the light, but aiming for a silhouette shot. So just making sure it's, it's quite easy to get that exposure right too. 
And of course, in Photoshop, I've brightened, brightened up the background behind them to make the black silhouette stand out really clearly against the bright background. The figure to ground thing again, black on white. I've seen a lot of silhouette shots and maybe the, the, the photographer could have pushed it further in editing to make the background brighter so that the, the figure or the subject stands out even stronger. Oops, wrong way. Yeah, and it's so important that there were no trees behind her here so that you could get a clear silhouette of her body. And the last thing to talk about is that for now is um, the idea of layering a photo. This is something that's really pretty hard to do and something that I've noticed Steve McCurry doing all the time in his shots. If you look at all of Steve McCurry's shots, there's always people behind and behind, but they're all in strategic places that they never could have just been anyway. So it's, you see these repeating patterns in his work where he's got he's directed people to be very specifically in certain places behind and behind and behind. And that's really hard to imagine. So it's hard to do and I admire that he can do that so effectively. And I'm trying to do it where I can. And it's not always the right chance to do something like that. But if you yeah, have multiple people that you can work with, you can try to have people behind, maybe even in front, like there's a foreground layer here as well. In uh, the deserts of India, yeah, it's hard. So I had to tell the camel driver to put one camel over there and then we could put one camel here and then you can sit here and then that camel was there and putting it all together. So it's kind of a big challenge. I think it's quite, quite tricky to do layering in your photos, but it's something to keep in mind if you want to, if you like Steve McCurry's work with all those people everywhere throughout the photo in a strategic place. Next time I look at Steve's work and you'll see that there's always someone else behind and behind and behind. And so in this case, same sort of thing. And since I'm directing, I can ask people exactly where to stand and get them all layered throughout the scene. And it makes it maybe more creative and more powerful. All right. Yeah, let's finish on that note. That's the last um, slide I had for composition. And yeah, we've covered many different techniques, I think. So anybody have any questions?